Howdy folks, and howdy Joe, Darwin's hamster, to whose video I am responding, albeit two weeks later or something like that. For those of you who don't watch Joe's videos, which you should, he is currently, among other things, working on a series of videos in which I think he is trying to explain the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in an intuitive way, which will be really interesting to see, so I'm looking forward to the rest of that series. And in the video I'm responding to, he asked for the interpretations of the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle and the double slit experiment as they're being taught in physics classes today uh, to, to compare, I guess, with what he learned and what other people on YouTube are saying about these things. So I'll share what I learned last year, pretty much, and the years before that uh, when I was doing my physics degree. As far as the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle goes, what I learned is basically what you learned. It's that you can't ever know the position of the momentum of a particle with absolute precision, so there'll always be some uncertainty in both of those measurements. And the product of the uncertainty in the position and the uncertainty in the momentum always has to be greater than or equal to some very, very small number, which I think is h bar over 2, or h over 2, but at any rate, it's really, really small. And what it means is that the more you know about the position of a particle, the less you know about its momentum. Or the more precisely you know the position, the less precisely you know the momentum. And that's pretty much it as far as the principle goes. I'm not exactly sure what you mean by an interpretation of the principle. To me, the principle is what it is. The more you know about the position, the less you know about the momentum. I don't know. I don't know what it means to interpret that. It, it is what it is. I haven't seen the videos that you're talking about, uh, the phantasmagoricals, so I, I don't know, I don't know what they think the principle means. Um, I think you said something about the electron knows where it is, or God knows where the electron is, and I don't know what those mean. I don't know what it means to say the electron knows, or God knows. I don't know what those things mean, and I don't know why it matters. I think the principle is still the principle, and yeah. You know, I believe it as much as you can believe anything, um, or I, I can take it as given and work physics problems with it. And So moving on from that, I clearly have nothing to add to the, to the discussion there, to the double slit experiment, which actually is really interesting and has a lot of cool interpretations, some of which could blow your mind. Basically, the idea behind the double slit experiment well, first, first, what happens when you pass light through a slit? I'm going to go through this really fast and skipping a lot of details. You can look it up on Wikipedia or somewhere else. It's really interesting. Basically, you pass light through a slit, and so you have a, a very, very small slit in sort of an opaque screen. You shoot some light through it, and then you put a screen over here so you can see what the light looks like. And it actually does not give you just an image of a slit if you have a rectangular slit. You don't get a rectangle. You actually get kind of a or sideways get kind of a spread out pattern that's very bright in the center and then it has sort of if you're graphing the intensity right? it's very bright in the center and then it kind of has little bumps out to the side not bumps but if you look at the pictures you'll know what I mean if on the other hand you have two slits in a little screen and you pass light through them both simultaneously and let it hit a screen over here you get a different pattern. And it's not what you would expect. You don't get the pattern from one slit overlapping the pattern from the other slit and just kind of adding up the intensities of the light. You get a completely different pattern that is made up basically of dots, I guess, if you look at it. It's, it is bright in the center and it gets dimmer as you go out, but it's a lot, lot wider than the diffraction pattern that you get from just one slit. And you can explain how you get this interference pattern from the two slits if you think of the light waves and how they travel out from the slits um, in the same way that water waves do. And they'll sort of interfere constructively and destructively, and that makes the bright and dark spots on the screen. And it probably doesn't make any sense if you've never heard it before, but seriously, look it up. There's some pretty good diagrams online. So... The, the interesting things start to happen when you send photons through the slit, photons being particles of light, one at a time. 
if you send photons through the slit one at a time, and you can do this by just getting a really, really dim light source so that um, you just don't produce photons fast enough for more than one of them to be in the box that the experiment is in at a time. And you have a detector where your screen is. You can tell where each particle hits. Even when one photon goes through at a time, you would think the photon would have to, you know, go through one slit or the other. You still get the interference pattern that you would get if you had a whole bunch of light going through. And the reason this is weird is because you wouldn't think you could use the same wave explanation because you don't have waves of light going through and interfering with each other to make this pattern. You just have one photon at a time and the one photon will make one dot on the screen as it goes through and then another photon will make another dot and another photon will make another dot. And if you do this long enough and you put all the dots together, you'll get the same pattern that you would if you just turned the light on and had them all go through. If that's not weird, it's probably because my explanation wasn't very clear. But it's a weird, weird thing. And it gets weirder. If you, you turn the light on, you cover up one slit. So you have two slits and you cover up one of them so that no light goes through. You get the diffraction pattern. Right? If you cover up the other slit, you get a, another single slit diffraction pattern. If you open them both, you get an interference pattern. If you send the photons through one at a time, and you make some kind of detector by the slits, so you can tell which slit the photon went through, then you don't get an interference pattern anymore then you actually do get the pattern for one slit plus the pattern for the other slit overlapping on top of each other. And it's exactly the same experiment as it was before when you got the, the two slit interference pattern and all you've done is you put a detector at the slit. It can be any kind of detector you want. Anything you can imagine that will tell you which slit the photon went through will destroy the interference pattern. Which seems crazy, but it comes down to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in a way that's probably more complicated than I can explain in like 30 seconds on a video with no drawings or equations. But you have to trust me on that one. You, you end up knowing more about the particle's position so you know less about its momentum. So it could be somewhere else than where you thought it would be. Something like that is the gist of the explanation. So that's just what happens. That's the weird part. That's the results of the experiment. Two slits open, interference pattern, even if one photon is going through at a time. The interpretation of that part, or at least what I was taught, is that when you have one photon going through at a time, it somehow exists in a superposition of states. So it exists in more than one state. And it manages to go through both slits and interfere with itself. The photon will interfere with itself and that will change the probability distribution of where it could appear on the screen. And it, you have to, you detect it once it gets to the screen. And then it actually is in a definite place. Until you detect the photon, it's not really in any location. It's, it has a probability distribution. It could be here with this probability, here with this probability, here with this probability, here with this probability. It's kind of got a a cloud of probabilities, like you might have heard about for electrons, electron clouds. Same idea with photons. So yeah, the photon goes through both slits and interferes with itself. That's the interpretation I learned. And the interpretation I learned for the other part of it, the part where you put the detector on the two slits as you send the photon through one at a time, um, is that, okay, you detect the photon and it is actually going through one slit. When you put the detector in there, then you've detected it, so it's no longer going through both slits. It's no longer in that superposition. You've collapsed the wave function, and I shouldn't put quotation marks around it. You have collapsed the wave function, and it is in a definite place when you measure it. Well, more or less definite. There's still some uncertainty. But it is definitely going through one slit or the other. And the interpretation of that is that light is both a particle and a wave, but not at the same time. If you're measuring the particle properties by detecting which slit it went through and saying it's in a definite location, then you can't, you can't, you can't see the wave properties, which would be the interference. 
Okay, so that's my quick and dirty version of what I remember from the last few years I've spent studying physics in college. Hopefully my explanations weren't too fuzzy or too wrong. If I tried to do it properly, it would take a lot more preparation, probably half an hour of video and a lot of diagrams. And I'm kind of busy and I just want to get the video out there, so I hope this helps at least a little bit. Bye kids!